Camping World encourages fans to get out there and visit the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. Welcome to the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum in Cooperstown, New York. I'm Lindsay Berra, joined by former AL home run champ Carlos Pena and curator Eric Stroll. And we're talking about the Hall of Fame Connections episode, From the Catch to the Steal. So we went from what was arguably the greatest catch in MLB history to baseball finally arriving on the West Coast to one of the most important stolen bases in postseason history. That was a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, from one to the other, right? So let's take those first two words, the catch. How many catches have been made in major league history, right? And only one gets that singular moniker of the catch. Yep. And we have that glove here, and I think uh, maybe we should take a look at this. Oh, these please. Yeah, so I yeah. can't wait. So uh, yeah, <laughs> let's get our gloves out. Glove yes. to look at the gloves. Let's get the gloves now. So to kind of set the stage, you know, this is 1954 World Series. The Yankees have just won five consecutive world champions, probably the greatest dynasty in, in sports history. And then the Indians win 111 games, which is the all-time record at the, up to that point for the American League. 111 games. That's 111 it. games. Yeah. And then go on to face the New York Giants. And the Indians have uh, Hall of Fame pitchers, uh, Bob Lemon, early win, Bob Feller on the team. Also Larry Doby. So we get the top of the eighth inning. It's tied two to two. Larry Doby walks, and then we have Al Rosen get a single. Up comes Vic Wirtz to the plate who's having arguably the greatest game uh, in World Series history, maybe his greatest game ever. Nice. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, he's facing Don Little, who's coming in as his first batter after Sal Magley pitches seven innings. So with two men on, Vic Wirtz comes to the plate and hits a smash to center field, right over Willie Mays' head, way over 400 feet. Should be a home run in many parks, right? But, but not there. And he runs back over his shoulder and makes that catch. This was at the Polo Grounds, right? Yeah. I mean, and then one of the things I remember about that park, well, the, the videos that we've seen, is it was really big. Deep. The center field was so deep. And he's running back, and yeah, when you say the catch, I immediately think of that. That's the glove? Yeah, so how would you like to play with that? Oh, man, this is great. I mean, look at this. That's amazing. I'm, I'm kind of actually afraid to touch it. This is the glove <laughs> Willie Mays had when he made that catch. Yeah. Because uh, how many times have you seen that video? Like thousands and thousands of times of Willie Mays. Such an iconic video. But let me, let me touch it for a second. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Unbelievable. Really cool. So he just went like this with it. Boop. How, <laughs> how long right. after the catch did he give you the glove? So that's a great story, actually. He wears it the rest of that season, the beginning of 1955, until he finally breaks in another glove. And so he's got it. He's saved it. But it's in his locker. He doesn't use it. And Don Little, who was the, the pitcher in that game, who, who gave up the almost hit to Wurtz, <laughs> is on a plane. They're going uh, from New York to St. Louis for a game against the Cardinals. He's bringing his son, six-year-old son. And they're sitting on the plane talking about how he wants to go play Little League, but he doesn't have a glove. And so the next day in the locker room, he comes to the game, and Willie Mays comes up to him and was like, I heard you want to play Little League, but you don't have a glove. How about you take this one? This is the one I used last year, <laughs> and I've broken a new one, and, and I don't need this one anymore. So it's been in the Little family ever since, and it's on loan to us, so it's actually oh, not part wow. of our... Wait a minute, did the kid play with it? And then he in played Little, Little League, League with he it. He went and played with it. Yeah. Are you kidding <laughs> me? Amazing. No, dead serious. <laughs> I mean, I, I wish I was that kid. Like, give me that glove. So it probably <laughs> was in a lot better shape initially, and then the kid played with it for a yeah. bunch of years. But wouldn't that be the greatest thing ever on the ball field? I'm using Willie Mays' glove, That's you know, when you're 12. Seriously, yeah. of course. Uh, it, you know, this is one of the things that I noticed. We talk about kids using two hands to catch the ball, yeah. and Willie Mays actually caught it almost like with two hands. I, I can see why with this. Tiny I mean, little Yeah, tiny little glove. Look at hands. this. <laughs> you have to use the other hand to kind of trap the ball. Yeah. You have to have perfect timing, perfect placement to get the ball, you know, running backwards, looking the other way to get the ball to land in there. Without breaking stride, which was like a yeah. perfect And then timing. turning around and firing the ball back in, so Doby only gets the third. Yeah, unbelievable, yeah. unbelievable. This is beautiful. So I thought this would be a great opportunity to look at another glove from an outfielder and maybe, you know, compare and contrast. So this is a Ty Cobb glove, okay? So we're talking at least 30 <laughs> years earlier. Nobody's making the catch with this thing. No. Right? They're making the, the bobble, the cover, yeah. the, okay. So, you know. The trap. The trap, yeah. Baseball, uh, the, the history of evolution of gloves is really interesting. And there's no, no gloves until about the mid to late 1870s. Then you see 1870s, you start to, start to wear them. By the mid-1890s, almost everybody's wearing them. 
They're starting as fingerless mitts, really, you know, just pads on the front and back. Mm -hmm. Then they become five finger workman's gloves. And now you're starting to see the evolution of the web. Yeah. And the glove will then become an actual tool for catching, right? It will become a hinge, a trap. Yeah, yeah. talk about having to use two hands yeah. to make a catch. If I thought you had to use two hands with that glove, how about with this one? I mean, it's literally, you're trapping it. But you know, baseball is the history of the evolution of, of the tools that you use. And of course, the, the glove being one of the, of the most pronounced. That is just super cool. What else have we got over here on this table? So in the episode we just watched, we talked about baseball going to the West Coast. And the Giants and the Dodgers go uh, in 58 and uh, begin to play uh, first major league teams on the West Coast. Eventually, Giants go to Candlestick, right? And then play World Series against the Yankees in 62. They don't play another World Series until 1989. And you have this Oakland A's jersey here. And that's Dave Stewart's from the 1989 World Series. Yeah. Now, the most famous moment, of course, right, wasn't actually a moment on the field, no. right? Uh, mm -hmm. Before game three, uh, he's already up two games to none, you have the earthquake with Al Michaels' call, which to this day gives me goosebumps. I remember watching that game with my parents in the living room and obviously not knowing what's going on. And that was the first time he was nominated for a news Emmy instead of a sports Emmy for that. But I, I wanted to point out, now Dave Stewart went 2-0 and at a complete game, one World Series MVP, was awesome in that series. But I did bring this out for another reason as well, and that is the yeah, elephant. The A's. Now, I always wonder about the elephant. I played for the A's. I wore this uniform, and I'm like, why do I have an elephant on my shoulder? What do the elephants have to do with Oakland? Right? At all. Yeah. <laughs> Please, enlighten me. Yeah, so it goes back to actually all the way back to the Philadelphia Athletics. So we're going back to 1902 with Connie Mack, uh, who was the manager of the Athletics, and John McGraw, who's the manager of the Giants. So these guys are familiar with one another. They're actually played against each other in the National League as players in the, in the late 1890s. So now you have this kind of American League versus National League thing, and you have this rivalry between McGraw and Mack. And McGraw's intent was to insult Connie Mack by saying that your team is a bunch of white elephants, which has a connotation to mean that it's something that is very rare and it's expensive to maintain. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but it's something you can't get rid of either. <laughs> so it really comes from like the kings of Siam would give their, their courtiers white elephants, which were sacred animals, albino elephants, and they'd be too expensive again to maintain. It would put them into financial ruin, but yet they couldn't. This is unbelievable. Get rid of it. Are you yeah. kidding me? That's what that means? On, on I feel so, like I would like it if someone gave me a white elephant. Yeah. Anyone wants to do that, I'll take a white <laughs> elephant. So they quickly embrace it. That's exactly what Connie Mack does. He's like, OK, you're going to call us white elephants. They end up winning the pennant in 1902. They end up being the most attendance in the American League in 1902. 1905, he puts the elephant on the World Series program, and they face the Giants in the World Series. They lose. But he goes on, and the A's beat the Giants in 1911, 1913. First time it goes on a jersey is 1918. And this is Ty Cobbs, by the way. We got the Ty Cobbs team oh, going. We got a lot of Ty Cobbs. He played uh, his last two seasons for the A's in 1927 and 1928. When the team goes to Kansas City, it's kind of, it's still there, but it's a little bit more in the background. It's more on programs and pennants and stuff. And then when Charlie Finley becomes owner of the Kansas City Athletics, he gets rid of it, replaces it with the mule. Fast forward to Oakland when Finley sells the team and, and Walter Haas becomes the owner, they decide to put the white elephant back on. That's so excellent. it goes back on in 88, the year before this jersey. And it's been on the sleeve ever since. That's why you had it on your sleeve. Yeah, that's that, that's insane. I mean, that, that it has so much history, history. Like that, and you don't even know it. I mean, and I wonder how many Oakland A's players actually understand why they have that on their shoulder. I think they should know. They need to know this story. This that's amazing. And, and what do we have here? So one of the we, things I noticed, we, you know, we again we watched the episode and we went from um, the catch and we end with the steal, right? So we go from Oakland 1989 World Series. Ricky Henderson also plays in that team, ends up going to the Dodgers, and in his last season with the Dodgers, Dave Roberts is his teammate. And then Dave Roberts, of course, is part of that 2004 uh, team. So, I mean, you guys, it's what, 17 years ago? But it seems like yesterday when, when that stuff happened. What do you, what do you that, recall that was from unbelievable. That? Look, I, I was, I was already in the big leagues, right? So I'm supposed to be a you know, professional Major League Baseball player. <laughs> I was such a fan still, you know? And, and when my season ended early, we, I was with the Detroit Tigers, um, I became a Red Sox fan because that's where I grew up, around Boston, after I came from the Dominican Republic. So, you know, all that story of the huge comeback, you know, Dave Roberts, the big steal, it's like just embedded in my mind as one of the most memorable moments in my uh, career as a fan, if anything, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, of baseball. 
so this was it was very dear to my heart when we started talking about Dave Roberts and that huge deal, and then the Red Sox yeah. uh, hadn't you know, played it all. In, hadn't played it all in that series. Yeah, these are Dave's cleats. Yeah. Those, these, wanna, these are the ones. I want to look at the bottoms of these and the They're bottoms of the old ones there. <laughs> the, those old ones over there with the speed. Yeah. So yeah, hadn't played all series, right? He comes in in the ninth inning. Well, yeah, that, everybody knew why he was in there. Yeah, yeah. and that's what, that's what makes it special. Yeah. Is that everybody knew he was going to steal? Roberts is going. Posada's throw. Roberts safe. So imagine making steals in these, though. And again, we're <laughs> going to we're going to finish with the Ty Cobb theme. We got a glove. We've got a jersey. So these are Ty Cobb's. And these cleats. are Ty Cobb's. So I, Ty what Cobb. I want to know is, were they ever swabbed for the DNA of opposing <laughs> midfielders? Because he was the king of the Look spiked up uh, slide, right? Look at these things. They're like teeth. Okay. So this is crazy. Could you so imagine? I heard, the, I heard the myth. I mean, I'm not even know if it's true that he used to sharpen his cleats. And by looking at him, I don't know, man. It, it kind of looks they're like he did. Very, they're very tall. But I mean, it's I a great like... story. There's a lot of things about Ty Cobb that are great stories and that are apocryphal. Some things we'll, we'll never quite know. But yeah, we won't know. But I don't know. I don't know, Eric. Sharpened I mean, that looks or not very sharp. You don't want those. You don't, don't want, want those cleats out. I don't want anywhere near my no. skin. And how about this? How about falling a ball off of your foot with these type of shoes? No protection. None. You got no protection. It's very thin, yeah. very light. No ankle support, no nothing. So, yeah, you could imagine wearing those shoes, Ty Cobb, and stealing 897 bases with a pair of spikes like that. This is, this is pretty cool. So an interesting journey from uh, the catch to the steel and some evolution of different artifacts along the way and a stop in California. Eric, thank you so much for sharing all these tremendous artifacts with us today. We hope that you've enjoyed this episode of our Hall of Fame Connection series. If you'd like to learn more about the people, places, and artifacts featured in this video, go to baseballhall.org, where you can plan your visit to the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum in Cooperstown, New York, and discover your own connections to the game. Thanks for watching. For more incredible stories, check out our Hall of Fame Connections series. And don't forget to subscribe. Placada!